So in case you're wondering, I'm Katrina. Um, I'm also working in Alex's lab on TMS MRI. Um, but we're going to ditch the TMS for now and I'm going to talk to you a bit about EEG fMRI uh, that I used during my PhD. So as we know, EEG and fMRI are different views onto our neural activity. So we've got good temporal resolution with our EEG, but relatively poor spatial resolution. And we're measuring the electrical potentials on the surface of the skull. Uh, whereas with fMRI, we've got relatively good spatial resolution, but relatively poor temporal resolution. So you can see why we might want to think about combining these two modalities, because they have opposite deficits. Uh, one of the first studies combining EEG and fMRI was actually motivated by uh, trying to improve localization of epileptic activity quite a long time ago. So you can see the setup that they're using here. They've got a couple of electrodes linking back to outside the scanner. And essentially, they were trying to see, well, if we can see the epileptic activity in the EEG, we can see when that occurs. Then we can look in the brain activity at those time points and see what's happening um, in relation to those epileptic spikes. Moving forward, we now have slightly more complicated setups. Uh, you can see we have now fixed caps that we can put inside the scanner. And we have amplifiers that are capable of going inside the MR environment uh, to really try and capture what's going on in the brain at these two different scales. Another thing to add is that you can have separate scanning strategies. So some people will record their EEG in separate scanning sessions. Uh, an alternative is that you put your EEG inside the scanner, but you record it in a silent scanning session. So you turn the MRI on and off and record the EEG interleave with that or you have your completely simultaneous design. And we'll come back to reasons why you may or may not want simultaneous recording. All right, so we've combined the recording. We've got these two huge data sets. Uh, we've got all our EEG and all our fMRI. Um, and the point of this huge diagram here is just to illustrate the number of choices that you have for all of your uh, pre-processing, all of your analysis, and everything that you could choose to do with this huge data set. But really, that just condenses down to three main steps. So you've got your pre-processing as normal for your EEG and your fMRI. Uh, you've then got to choose the feature that you're interested in, in the EEG. Uh, and then you run your standard fMRI analysis as well. We can simplify all of these methods by thinking about whether they are asymmetrical or symmetrical. And all that means is, in asymmetrical, you use a feature from one modality to inform the other. Whereas in symmetrical, you try and combine them without giving any bias to one method over the other. And I'll just talk you through two different possible methods. The first one is an asymmetrical method, and it's called EEG informed fMRI. And essentially what you do is you take your EEG data, you choose a feature of interest. So you might be interested in an ERP value at each trial, for example, a P300 value and you extract that value from each trial that you're interested in. At the same time, you take your fMRI and you have your standard um, series of events. And all that you do is you use your EEG values to construct a parametric regressor such that your predicted bold is now co-varying with the changes in the EEG amplitude. So essentially all that means is if your EEG is increasing, you're expecting an increase in the bold. And obviously, the interpretation of this is going to depend on which feature you want to extract from your EEG. Uh, here's an example of what you might find. So from this paper from de Bene, they've taken the error-related negativity, which essentially you have an increased negativity when somebody makes an error. And they've taken the single trial values of that and put it into their ERP-informed fMRI. And here they find some increased or correlated activity in the ACC. A kind of caveat to this is, OK, it's really nice we can find brain activation with activity that co-varies with fluctuations in the EEG, but how much further you can go with your interpretation will obviously depend on what you choose from your EEG feature, but also just to say that it's not necessarily the neural generator of the EEG that you're looking at. It could be that they're reflecting a common source somewhere else. OK. And um, I'll just summarize another method that you could use to analyze your data. So this is a more symmetrical approach, and it's based on ICA. So ICA is independent component analysis, and it's essentially trying to find statistically independent components within your data. You can do that in two ways. So you can do temporal or spatial ICA. 
Uh, and typically we do temporal ICA on the EEG because we have more time points than we have sensors. Uh, and we do spatial ICA on the MRI because we have the opposite. We have more voxels than we have time points usually. So what they've done is they've run the parallel ICA separately. So one on the EEG and they've got an IC component here, which is a temporal time course. And they've also got a spatial map here from the fMRI. And essentially what they do is they look at the time courses of all of their components and they try and match them. So if we have a change, an increase in the trial in our temporal ICA, do we also have an increase in the uh, fMRI component? Okay, so obviously that has its own um, caveats and how much you can interpret those as, again, as this being the source of this is um, not always clear. So you might be thinking, well, if we can do simultaneous recording of EEG fMRI, why wouldn't we just always do that? Because then you'd be recording the brain activity at the same time, all the time, uh, and all the activity is matched perfectly in both. Um, but there are some downsides to doing it simultaneously. You might want to do simultaneous in the following um, condition. So if you're interested in a phenomenon that's not particularly stable over time, so you have reason to believe that you might not capture the same activity if you ran two separate recording sessions, then you may want to record uh, together. Um, and also in these cases of spontaneous activity, so for example sleep, what you could do is use the EEG to tell you when someone's in a particular sleep stage and then look at the fMRI uh, in response to that sleep stage. So in that case you might want to record them together. And also, if you're planning to use single trial values, then you might want to record them simultaneously because you wouldn't necessarily know that the activity at each trial is matched across separate sessions uh, in some paradigms. Okay. However, if we do record EEG and fMRI simultaneously, we incur several additional artifacts on top of what we normally have in the EEG. So this is the gradient artifacts that's caused by the MR scanner. And I'm just zooming in as we go down here. So this is the EEG before we turn on the scanner, and this is the scanner shimming. And then once you have the scanner turned on, your EEG is just completely black uh, because it's completely overruled by this huge um, artifact from the gradient switching on and off. However, if we zoom into it really closely here, you can see it is quite stable over time. Um, so one of the methods to remove this is we just create a template of this artifact and we subtract it from the time series. Um, and that works relatively well. Unless you have a huge subject movement, which then changes the template of this on the electrodes. Uh, another artifact, this one is much more difficult to remove, uh, and it's correlated with the heartbeat of the participant. It's called the ballista cardiogram. If you're familiar with normal EEG, you'll see that this looks really noisy. Um, you have all these waves here that seem to mirror each other, depending on the side of the skull that they're recording from. And essentially, it's caused by um, movements of the blood vessels yeah, um, underneath the cap, and that moves the electrodes. And we get these increased waves here related to the heartbeat. <coughs> so what we normally do with EEG from is we have an additional electrode to record the actual heartbeat. Um, and then again, we try and create a template of the heartbeat to remove from our signal, to hopefully remove this artifact. Uh, however, you can imagine that people's heart rate changes quite a lot over an experiment. They might be really nervous at the start, um, so they'll have a faster heart rate, or they might move and then the electrode moves, and therefore you get a different measure of the signal. And so it can be really, really hard to remove this artifact from the data. Um, and I've had to throw out participants because I couldn't remove this properly. Okay, just a final one. It's not just the EEG that's ruined, not ruined, uh, signal reduced. <laughs> Um, if we look here at the field when we're measuring at different strengths and um, without a cap here or with 64 or 32 channel cap, you can really see the presence of the electrodes uh, in the MR field here. All right, so the downsides of simultaneous is that you've got a lower signal to noise ratio. Um, we're also limited in the EEG equipment that we can use at the moment. So as far as I know, the highest density caps available are 64. Um, and obviously they're passive electrodes, they're not active electrodes, so it takes a long time to set them up. Um, and because of that, we've got this long preparation time. It can also be difficult to optimise the design when you're forcing EEG and fMRI into the same experiment, so you might lose it on that as well. Just the final thing to consider, so we know that EEG and fMRI are different windows onto the neural activity and the behaviour that we're interested in. 
Um, and they might overlap in some cases, they might not overlap. We also need to think about how they overlap here with behaviour, and which is what we're really interested in overall. Okay, thank you.